So hello everyone and welcome to our webinar this afternoon covering the USDA Community Facilities Direct Loan and Grant Program. My name is Sarah Stalkup jones and I am a program coordinator here with Virginia Clean Cities. Um, and before we start, I want to give you a brief rundown of the event. Uh, so first, I will start off by giving you all a bit of information about our Drive Clean Rural USA project that allows our team at Virginia Clean Cities to provide free technical assistance to fleets in Virginia. Then we will hear from Perry Hickman and Barbara Hodges with USDA Rural Development, who will tell us about the USDA Community Facilities Direct Loan and Grant Program and how it may be used to support your fleet's transition to alternative fuels. We'll also have a question and answer session at the end of today's webinar, so please put any questions that you have in the Q&A box as we move forward. Um, so first, I'll tell you a little bit about the Drive Clean Rural USA project. Uh, the free technical assistance available to rural Virginia fleets is provided through the Drive Clean Rural USA project. And this is a DOE funded project headed by the Transportation Energy Partners and facilitated by eight clean cities coalitions across the United States. This project also has a group of amazing industry partners who will provide demonstration vehicles, training, and technical expertise on the full range of clean fuel vehicles on this project. Um, this is a fuel neutral project. We believe that any transition away from petroleum based fuels is a positive step, and we will work with you to find the right fuel solutions based on your needs. So, for example, we have biodiesel, electric, natural gas, and propane as some of the highlighted fuels that we can help you transitions to. Um, we understand that there are barriers to access that are leaving small and rural communities out in the transition to clean fuels, and this program is looking to fix that. Our goal is to get more small and rural communities benefiting from clean fuels and vehicles. Um, so through this project, we'll be providing fleets with four areas of assistance. There's fleet technical assistance, access to demonstration vehicles, regional jobs and business growth support, and the promotion of fleet leadership. Now, the most significant asset that partner fleets will receive is in-depth technical assistance. Um, through this, we'll work closely with your fleet managers to assess your current fleets in order to identify where it might make sense to start to transition to clean fuel vehicles. Uh, our goal here is to help you create a five to 10 year plan that makes financial sense and can be realistically implemented. This also includes helping connect your fleets to funding opportunities and incentives, such as the loan and grant program we will be discussing today. Our industry partners are also loaning vehicles for demonstration purposes that will help organize for your fleets. These vehicle providers also have technical expertise and will be able to help share tips and training with your fleet operators and technicians. And a big priority of the Drive Clean Rural USA project is to share lessons that we've learned that can help other small and rural communities benefit from clean fuels. Uh, participating fleets will be featured in a replication playbook, which will be disseminated nationally through the Department of Energy, Clean Cities Coalitions, our industry partners, and other organizations. All along the way, we want to spotlight the leadership of the participating rural fleets. Um, and so that's a summary of the program that we're offering. Um, we'd like to invite you to reach out to the Virginia Clean Cities team if you have any questions or would like to be included. Um, and now I will hand it over to Perry and Barbara, who will tell us about the USDA Community Facilities Direct Loan and Grant Program. Um, and I will pull up their presentation now. Okay, Sarah, thanks a lot. Uh, we really appreciate you extending this opportunity to us to talk about the Community Facilities Direct Loan and Grant Program. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Okay, as uh, Sarah mentioned, uh, I'm Perry Hickman, uh, the Virginia Rural Development State uh, Director. Previously, I was a Community Programs Director for the state of Virginia. Uh, and also we have with us today are uh, Barbara Hodges. Uh, she's the Acting Community Programs Director and she primarily works in our Community Facilities Program. Okay, next slide. Through the, community, through the USDA Community Facilities Program, we provide affordable funding to develop essential community facilities or to improve community infrastructure and essential community facilities for public use 
in rural areas. We define an essential community facility as a facility that provides essential services to local communities for the orderly development of that community. To be eligible for, uh, to be eligible, the facility must be located in and primarily serve a rural area and does not include private, commercial, or business undertakings. Uh, we can finance more than 100 different types of uh, facilities through community facilities. Uh, nationally, the CF portfolio, CF, um, when I say CF, I'm referring to community facilities. Uh, our portfolio is 12.5 billion in closed direct loans, guaranteed loans, and grant advances. Additionally, there is more than 4 billion in obligation for projects that are under construction but yet to be closed. Next slide. As of right now, we have, we have not been given our FY22 state allocation, but we expect similar funding for the CF program in FY22 as we had in FY21 because the congr uh, congressional appropriations are similar this year as they were in FY21. For our direct loan program, we received 55 million. In our guaranteed loan program, Virginia received 5 million. And for the CF regular grant program, we received 775,000. So that kind of gives you an idea of our allocation in FY21, and it should be very similar in FY22. Next slide. Okay, so I want to talk about our direct loan program first. And typically, uh, there are three basic eligibility requirements with the, with the program. Uh, first, you want to ask yourself the purpose. Will the RD funds be used to fund a project to provide an essential community service? The second question or eligibility criteria would be, what is the rule and, and are you and are, would your facility be located in our definition of rural? And third, entity. Does this entity meet the RD regulatory requirements? And then we'll go a little bit deeper into those uh, into the discussion. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we have financed more than 100 different types of facilities or projects through the community facilities loan and grant programs. About 48% of these of our portfolio uh, are healthcare related facilities. 28% are culture and educational type facilities, 9% public buildings, 6% public safety facilities, and the remaining 9% are other facilities, um, uh, are considered other, other facilities. Now during the presentation today, I'll share information with you about the CF loan and grant programs and the importance of understanding those three initial eligibility requirement questions that I just asked. Okay, next slide. Eligible rural areas, what do we consider rural? Um, cities, towns, and census designated places with population of, of 20,000 or less, according to the latest decennial census of the United States, is what we consider rural. Right now, we're still using the 2010 census data, but effective October this year, we'll actually be moving to the 2020 census uh, data. Um, so if, uh, if, you're, if you're in a located in a city, small city, town, or a, cens a census designated place with a population of 20,000 or less, then you would be considered eligible for the CF program. Now, as far as if we're looking at a, um, unincorporated area, as long as it's a rural, uh, then it would be eligible for the CF program. And it's not included in, a, in, in that uh, area is not included in a uh, census designated place. Okay, next slide. We talk about who's eligible for the program. The program is eligible for public bodies, such as small towns, uh, small cities, towns and special service districts. Nonprofit corporation organizations, which 
have significant community financial support uh, and also if they have local ties to that community. Also eligible for the program is federally recognized tribes. Okay, next slide. Okay, as for eligible purposes, CF funds can be used to purchase, construct, and or improve essential community facilities. Also to purchase equipment and to pay project related expenses. Now, we can allow a refinancing if it's less than 50% of the total project cost, but the, but the refinance has to be related to the project that's being, uh, that, that you're actually expanding. So if you're looking at adding on to a facility, uh, we can actually um, uh, refinance up to 50%, as long as it's not RD funds being refinanced and, the, and those items are part of the existing project. Okay, next slide. Now, since our audience today is primarily concerned with public safety type facilities, I'll focus on eligible law enforcement uh, facilities. Uh, public safety uh, services such as police vehicles, equipment, and this includes uh, electric vehicles and charging stations, rescue and recovery vehicles, body cameras, ballistic vests, fire and rescue buildings, vehicles and equipment, public work buildings, vehicles and equipment, those are eligible um, projects under the CF program. As far as public buildings are concerned, we can finance police stations, detention centers, town halls, courthouses, and administrative buildings. Now, this is a small list of what we can, what we can finance because as I mentioned earlier, we can finance more than 100 different type of facilities. So if the facility that you're looking at, uh, that you're gonna need some financial assistance, it's best to give us a call to see if it's gonna be eligible for the CF program. So, and, I'll, and, I, and later in the, in, the, in the presentation, I'll provide contact information for the offices that we have around the state. Okay, next slide. Some of the things that we, we do need to consider when working with the CF uh, loan program. So the first thing is collateral. The borrower must pledge sufficient assets to ensure repayment of the loan. Uh, the security may include any combination of the following, which is real estate, uh, machinery and equipment, assured income, or accounts receivable. Plus, if federal funds are included in a project, then we must uh, be sure that maximum open and free competition is used when procuring services. So we wanna make sure that when you're bidding a project, that it's bidded appropriately so that maximum open and free competition has been, or that you can actually show that maximum open, free and competition has been followed. Okay, next slide. Now, as far as the, our loan program is concerned, uh, real estate type transactions, we can actually go up to 40 years on the term of the loan. Uh, now, we do look at the appraisal of that, uh, of that uh, facility. If, it's, if the remaining economic life is less than 40 years, then of course, we would actually use the remaining economic life of that facility to determine the maximum loan term. Uh, as far as equipment is concerned, we actually have a uh, depreciation schedule that we, that we look at and we can actually finance that up to the life expectancy of that uh, equipment. Now, as far as interest rates are concerned, as of April 1, our interest rate is at 2.25%. Okay, next slide. Additional requirements. Earlier, I mentioned that the facility must be located in and serve a rural area. Additionally, the applicant must have the legal authority to borrow money, be able to finance, be unable to finance the project with their own funds or through a conventional lender. And the reason is that RD does not compete with local community lenders. 
and the applicant must show evidence that they are unable to finance the proposed project with their own resources or through commercial lending at a reasonable rate and term. Also, <clears throat> substantial community support is a requirement. So your project must be evidence that it's supported by the community and that it has financial support from a reliable source for the success of that project. Okay, next slide. Now I wanna talk a little bit about our CF grant program. Um, next slide. The grant program, as you'll see, it's the, the eligibility requirements of the grant program are the same, the same criteria as the direct loan program. Um, the, our grant program is available when the entity does not have the capacity to repay a loan. So what we would basically look at is we would look at your financials and determine if you do not have the capacity to repay a loan. And if that's the case, then you would be grant eligible. Now the grant is based on the population and the medium household income of the area being served. And the, our grant participation could range anywhere from 15% to 75%. And the maximum grant is at $50,000 for a project. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we typically receive about 700, uh, less than 800,000 per year uh, in grant funds compared to about 55 million in direct loan funds. So we, every year we do have more grant applications than we have grant funds available. And so in order to spread the monies around to uh, a lot of locations, we have limited that to the uh, 50,000 max for a uh, project. So, but you could put applications in for several different projects. And um, uh, we, we, we could actually consider that as well. Okay, next slide. Now, how to reach rural development or our structure? We actually, we have a national office. We're in, it's headquartered in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're in, uh, but we do have state offices uh, in uh, 40, 47 states. But on a local level, there is RD footprint in every county or, or, or in each state. Virginia actually has four area offices and four sub offices, and these local offices are there to assist each of you. So instead of having to work with the state office, you would basically work with the area office that's uh, closest to you. Now, as far as information on our area offices, next, next slide. The next slide will basically show you our Southwestern Virginia uh, area office, which is in Lebanon, Virginia. Now we have uh, two, Community Programs Area Specialist to assist you. Robert Hilt, he's located in our Lebanon office. And Jason Carter, he's located in our Lebanon office as well. And the area director, Craig Barbro, he's in our Withville office. So if you're in one of those counties in Southwest Virginia, then those would be the contact individuals to assist you with the community facilities program. Now on the next slide, we go into area two, which is more of central Virginia, where in the area office is located in Lynchburg. And Cindy Bomar is the community program specialist out of our Lynchburg office and the area director, his name is David Worley. So there you'll see the contact information for individuals if you're located in central Virginia. Now on our next slide, we have uh, information on our northernmost area office, uh, the area office in Harrisonburg and a sub office in Culpeper. Um, Cindy Hines is located in our Harrisonburg office and she's a program, a community program specialist in the Harrisonburg, but we also have Daniel Warnermaker located in our, located in our Culpeper office. And he actually does provide services for those counties near and around the Culpeper area. And then the area director uh, for 
uh, Area 3 is Steve Davis, and he's located in our Harrisonburg office. And on the next slide is our last area, uh, which is uh, area office in Cortland, uh, Virginia, and we have a sub office here in Richmond. Now, Peggy Jordan is the area specialist in the Cortland office. So a lot of central uh, 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 of the eastern part of the state is actually covered by Peggy Jordan out of the Cortland office. And Tara Delaney, who's here in our Richmond office, will cover a lot of the counties in the northern neck and central, uh, other portion of central Virginia area. Uh, and their supervisor, he's out of the uh, Cortland office as well. And his name is Myron Wooden. Okay. So that's a brief summary of the, of the community facilities program. And as I mentioned, we do have those area offices to provide assistance uh, to individuals with inquiries on the, on the program. But one of the things that I did want to discuss is that um, you want to make sure that you actually understand is the project, the, the, the primary eligibility requirements, location, entity, and the project itself, if it meets the basic requirements. So those are some of the key things that I wanted to share with you today. But when you get deep into the weeds with this, then it's going to be best to actually reach out to the RED staff so we can actually assist you in moving your application forward or answering questions as it pertains to your meeting the uh, uh, objective that you're trying to achieve. So I want to thank you. And now we'll actually have questions, uh, answer any questions that we might have. And thank you, Perry. That was a great overview of the program. Um, I also just want to highlight um, to those of you in attendance, um, as Perry mentioned, and um, through Virginia Queen Cities, we know that there are some people here specifically interested in fleets. Um, and for alternative fuels, if any of you have looked into them, um, you may know that the most expensive or the, um, the biggest barrier to purchasing alternative fuel vehicles is that upfront cost. They typically cost more. But over time, you get fuel savings and maintenance savings. So looking into these programs, it might be a way to help your rural community um, bring these fleets in without having that high upfront capital cost hit your budget as hard. Um, so that's definitely a consideration that we would like you guys to consider. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing your presentation so I can pull up some of the questions that people sent in. And then um, for those of you who are on, please let me know um, using the Q&A if you have any additional questions that you would like to have answered. So let me just navigate over to those questions real fast. Um, so the, the first question that we had asked, and I think this is also outlined on your fact sheet, is what's the general timeline a county might expect for funding? maybe from the, the start date of reaching out to your offices? Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to depend upon when they actually do reach out to us, because, of course, our fiscal year actually begins on October 1. And with if there is no budget in place, we'll actually be operating on a continuing resolution. So it all depends on when the when we actually do have funding that we can make a a, a better determination on when projects are, are, are actually funded. We also have to look at priority points because our funding is basically uh, for those areas that are more needy areas, they actually have priority over those areas that have higher incomes uh, with greater uh, and greater population. So that's going to play a factor as well. Now, in the past years, with the amount of loan funds that we do get for those projects that are requesting loan only funds, we typically, if we have our allocation or if the national office has funds in reserve, we can typically uh, fund those in, in, a, in, a, in a pretty quick fashion. But also, it depends on the type of project as well. Construction projects actually do require more uh, than an equipment project because, of course, we have to make sure that we actually do our due diligence as it pertains to the financial reviews. 
also the environmental process, because those are two of the bigger time drivers a time drivers as it pertains to the application process. So, so, I mean, I hate to sound like I'm avoiding the question, but it's a, there are several different things that could actually play into the determining of when things can be funded. Now, if we have funds and everything um, is in order, we can actually move pretty quickly. And I think that that's a great answer and it gives people things to consider as they begin planning out their projects and their timelines. Um, and also sort of um, running along that, I know that you mentioned that um, the grants are in high demand typically. Is there typically mm -hmm. a, a certain time of year that you see that those grants are already typically subscribed to if people are trying to plan out when they should get applications in? Well, in, as far as the grants are, well, what we typically do, since our, our fiscal year ends on uh, September 30th and funds are pooled by the national office in the first week, first, second week of August, it's going to be, if they have not gotten their applications into us in the June, July timeframe, then time is going to be really, really critical as far as being able to score them. But typically, I mean, we accept applications year round. But of course, at some point in time, we, we don't have funding all the time. So um, I would say we, we, we will definitely accept applications year round. Excellent. And that was one of the next questions that we got. It was asking if you guys had um, had a rolling program, which it sounds like mm -hmm. you do. Um, they, they also had a second part of their question was if they apply one year and do not get approved for the project, say they apply at the very end of the year, would they be able to reapply the next year with the Well, system? actually, yeah, well, actually, we'll, we'll keep the act application active. Uh, if we run out of funds, we'll keep the application active for the next funding cycle. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and then I had a question that was submitted that's a little bit more specific. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to make sure that I uh, relay this in a, an understandable manner. Um, so. The first part of the question is, would school fleets be available for this funding, such as if they were interested in purchasing like a propane or an electric school bus? Mm -hmm. there yeah, anything? actually it would be. I mean, since, they, since they're considered a public body, uh, then of course they would be an eligible, eligible applicant. Uh, and of course it would have to be servicing a rural, rural communities. And um, so they've met the, uh, applicant, they've met the project, and they've met the uh, uh, location. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And then sort of along that same line, could this um, funding be combined or supplemented by other federal funding programs? Yeah, actually, we encourage that. We do encourage leveraging funds with other uh, federal partners and or local or uh, uh, philanthropic um, organizations as well. Because the more funds we actually get into a project, that's going to mean that we have more funds available to assist more rural communities. So we actually encourage leverage funds uh, via other federal partners or, or other sources as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is the really specific part of the question. Um, so as you may be aware and some of our attendees may be aware, the EPA Clean School Bus Program is going to release their first round of funding, which is going to mm -hmm. be a rebate program. Um, we were asked if it would be possible for a rural school district to use like something like the loan program through this USDA grant or grant and loan program to purchase a bus um, in the interim while they're waiting for a rebate to be approved. Um, yeah. Would they be able to do that and then use the rebate to pay back the loan? Yeah, one of the good things about our program is that uh, we don't have any prepayment penalties. So say for instance, if they do finance with us, and they come into a large windfall of funds through some through some source. They can actually pay off those uh, pay off that uh, outstanding uh, uh, the outstanding balance on the RD loan. Yes, yes, absolutely. Excellent. Um, so th that was my school bus related question. Um, and then another thing, um, and I think your your presentation answered it pretty well. But um, you mentioned the cost the cost of charging stations being eligible for mm -hmm. like an an electrification project for a fleet. Um, would that also be able to consider the uh, installation costs like trenching and electric capacity expansion or would that branch into a construction project? Yeah, that's the, that 
it we would have to look at how it's going to actually be set up because of course when we get into disturbing soil then that makes it a little bit more complex because it, it actually invokes uh, certain environmental requirements. So we would have to look at that on a case by case basis though. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so what I'm hearing is contact your office early on yeah, in the process. Exactly. It's best to contact the offices uh, that serves your county as early as possible so that you'll know how to proceed. Because when you get into the in, in, into environmental and feasibility studies, uh, those are time drivers and they can be somewhat expensive. So with that being said, you, you don't want to do an environmental and it's not the right environmental and then you have to go back through the process again or the same thing with the financial feasibility report. So those are some of the things that you, you would definitely want to uh, uh, reach out to us early on. Excellent. Um, and then the, the last question that I had submitted um, was, do you have any examples of other fleets that have utilized this funding that you can think of or recall that you could share? Barbara, you might be a better resource than I am on that. This like um, police vehicles or that kind of thing? Yes. Um, well, let me look at this year's funding spreadsheet. Hold on just a minute. <clears throat> While you're doing that, um, I'll just say that um, for those of you who are with us, um, please reach out to us if you have any questions. We would love to um, talk to you guys about your specific circumstances. The Virginia Clean Cities team can help you guys do fleet assessments um, and help figure out what type of project might be eligible and will work for you um, both for your fleet and for your budget. Um, and then, of course, the, the contacts that Perry outlined um, would be great resources for you as well. Okay, um, so for this fiscal year that started in October, um, we've done a, a fire truck for City of Galax, um, police and emergency vehicles for City of Norton, uh, fire and rescue equipment for Stickleville Volunteer Fire Department, um, sanitation vehicle for Giles County PSA, um, a dump truck for Coburn Norton Wise Regional Wastewater Treatment Authority, um, a fire truck for Town of Clarksville. Um, we've done a, a dorm um, for Ferrum College. Um, we've done a building for nonprofit Har Harvest Outreach Center. We've done um, Piedmont Regional Jail Vehicles. Um, town of Dayton police vehicles, town of Stephen City town hall renovations, um, town of Anancock dump truck trailer and chipper, Eastern Shore Public Library or Parksley archive storage, um, and then we've done some emergency rural health care grants um, this year for um, a food bank expansion. Um, emergency uh, Northampton County it did a um, EMS vehicles, um, free clinic, the COVID-19 testing and vaccine administration. We've done something with um, telehealth and remote monitoring for Page Memorial Hospital um, and Wellmont Health System, Lonesome Pine Hospital and Taswell Community Hospital. So those are the things that we've already funded this fiscal year. Um, like Perry said, there's a wide variety of things that we can do. Um, the, we have done school buses. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different types of fleet vehicles that we've done before. Excellent. Awesome, yeah, as you said, this, this shows the diversity of what um, this program can fund. Um, and I think that concludes all of the questions that we had submitted. Um, so Barbara and Perry, are there are there any like final thoughts that you guys would want to share um, or any resources um, that we could direct people to? Um, would it be all right if we shared this presentation? Um, yeah, it would be. It would be. And what and as I mentioned, uh, uh, since we can fund a wide variety of things, Barbara gave you a list and I, I said well over 100 different type of facilities. It's going to be best if you it's gonna be best that the entity contact us early to see 
if it's a eligible, if the project is actually eligible, if it meets that criteria to be an eligible project for the CF program. Uh, and that's going to be the best way to to make that determination without spending any, without spinning their wheels, spinning their wheels uh, on a project. Just give us a call, and we can make that determination kind of quickly, uh, as far as the uh, on a, on a on a on a preliminary eligibility. And uh, but then when we get into the project itself, we'll get deeper into specific questions. But yes, yes, definitely contact us. Excellent. Well, I think this has been a really efficient webinar. Thank you for answering all of those questions. Um, for those of you who are in attendance, um, like I said, we are going, we are recording this event. Um, I will be able to share this um, on our Virginia Queen City's YouTube page soon, soon and we'll also pass it around to you all uh, through the email that you use to register. We will also be creating um, an article after the fact that sort of summarizes um, the main points um, and also links you to resources such as the back sheet. Um, that Perry has shared with us for this program as well. So I just wanted to thank everyone for coming today. Um, thank everyone who submitted such great questions um, and good luck with all of your projects out there. Absolutely. And again, thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Well, have a great rest of your afternoon, everyone. Enjoy the spring water. Thank you. Thank you.